Lord, we've just sung our prayer to you. We ask that you would speak to us. Lord, what a privilege it is to have your word written. Lord, help us to delight in these truths. Help us to understand these truths. Help us to live for these truths. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, in just a few minutes, our missionary guest is going to come and share about how his family is planning to partner with uh, Bible translators in Cameroon. Uh, the Hare family that we as a church support, they've been here with us. Uh, they're going to go and partner with them. He's going to explain how he's uh, going to help this highly illiterate people, a people who primarily do not read and write, help them engage with the scripture as it is being translated for them. But before he comes, I want us to take a few moments and look to the word of God to answer a simple question. Here it is. What is the Bible for? What is the point of scripture? What is it that God is doing with his word? We'll see the answer here in Isaiah 55. Our text begins at verse 6. Hear now the word of the Lord, God's holy, perfect, inerrant, infallible word. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word that goes out from my mouth It shall not return to me empty. It shall accomplish that which I purpose. It shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. This is the word of the Lord. At the end of this short passage, we learn that God's word shall succeed. God has sent his message on a mission. And that mission will be accomplished. The task of the Bible will most certainly be completed. So the question is, what is that task? What is the mission of God's word? What is the purpose that the Lord is seeking to accomplish in giving us the scripture? Well, not long ago, we were in 2 Timothy and we saw the answer. In 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, we read this. All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for. So we're about to be told what the Bible's for. Here's its use, what God has given it to us for. It is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So to summarize that, God's word has been given for our Christian growth for spiritual maturity. God has given his word to sanctify his people. But that's not all. In the verse just prior, verse 15, we read this. The sacred writings are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So God's word is what God uses to save souls. His word makes us wise enough to put our faith in Christ Jesus. God has sent his word to save and sanctify a people for his own glory. The message of the Bible is that God is rescuing the unrighteous. It's the good news that God saves sinners. God will accomplish this great mission. The mission of saving souls. And we actually see that in our passage here in Isaiah. So look back at verses six and seven. An invitation, a summons. He says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way 
and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. So we're in rapid succession given four commands. We're told to seek, to call, to forsake, and to return. In a sense, all of these are really just unified one action. He's calling us to do one thing. If this is the way of sin, this is what is wrong and evil, and over here we have God and his way and what is good and righteous, he's simply calling us to turn away from our sin and to God, right? Forsake our wicked way, return to the Lord. This one motion, turn away from what is wrong to the God who saves. Now, sometimes people try to do half of this without the other. They have this assumption, well, I can trust God, but I'll just keep on in my sin. Uh, but, But there's a disconnect there. That is not true. You cannot do one without the other. These things go together. You cannot seek the Lord without forsaking your sin. Imagine a man who leaves his wife. He goes on and has a a regular sexual affair. But then he he calls his wife. He seeks his wife. And she says to him, have you forsaken that woman? And he says, no, I I can't do that. But but I want you. Well, that, that woman would rightly say, you're not actually seeking me. Your call is empty. Right? If we're actually going to return to the Lord, we must turn away from our sin. We must abandon the old life. This text says turn and receive compassion, receive pardon. Now we're told specifically why we need to forsake our our ways and our thoughts. In verse 8, look there. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. The reason we need to forsake our wicked way is it's not like God's way. The way we need to turn from our unrighteous thoughts is that they're not like God's thoughts. We fall miserably short of God's standard. He continues that line of reasoning in verse 9. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts than your thoughts. His point is that there is this infinite chasm between God and his holiness And us in our sin. He's making it clear that there's actually no way we could reach the Lord. He is infinitely beyond us. And since we can't fix this problem, the Lord has to come to us. He comes down to us. Look at verse 10. He gives us this image. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven... And do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty. It shall accomplish that which I purpose. It shall succeed in the thing which I have sent. So let's catch the image here. God says, you know how this works. Uh, the, The rain falls and it does something. It goes and it's productive. It, it makes the earth fruit and flower, right? We have plants growing because the rain comes. Well, in the same way, God's word comes down and it will accomplish its mission. God's word comes and it proclaims the way of salvation, the hope to those who are hopeless. The Bible presents the gospel. Now, you may have noticed that I I skipped over an aspect of this passage. There at the end of verse 7. But let's read six and seven together. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. We're being told that this offer is a limited time offer. You need to come now. The gospel calls you to respond. The scripture says today is the day of salvation. Here's the invitation. Here's the call. Let the wicked forsake his way. The unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. Here's the good news that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Brothers and sisters, this is good news. This here in the Old Testament is the gospel. There is hope for sinners. God promises to forgive those who repent. He offers pardon to those who turn away from their sin. What an incredible invitation. 
What a deal. It's not that now we have to be perfect. He says, turn and come and I will show you mercy. Those who turn away from their sin, those who seek the Lord, they receive mercy. Those who return to the Lord receive compassion. This really is astounding. It's undeserved grace and mercy. God forgives those who forsake their wicked way. God pardons those who put off their unrighteous thoughts. Look at the end of verse 7 again. It's, it's almost too good to be true. That he may have compassion on him to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. It does raise a question, though. How can God do such a thing? I mean, the idea of forgiving, it sounds wonderful, but how can it be just? How can it be right for God to take guilty sinners and to let them off the hook? How can the judge of all the earth, who is holy and righteous and good, how can he simply sweep our sin under the rug? Well, that would indeed be an injustice. That would be wrong. So how can God pardon our sin without violating his justice? Well, Isaiah has actually given us the answer just two chapters prior. Famously in Isaiah 53, there's a vision of the coming Messiah. Isaiah writes, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement, the punishment that brought us peace. With his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned his own way, but the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. You see, the Bible's clear that God will by no means clear the guilty. And so Jesus Christ came and he took our guilt for us. And the punishment that it deserved, justice is served in that Jesus dies as our substitute. Our sin receives the penalty penalty that it deserves so that we can justly, rightly be shown mercy. This is the gospel. This is the good news. In light of what Christ has done, this offer in Isaiah 55, it goes out to sinners. Anyone who will repent and put their trust in the Messiah, they shall be saved. They shall receive this glorious pardon. But brothers and sisters, This text makes us deal with this last important issue. Sinners must hear this invitation. Sinners must hear the call of the gospel. And so God's God's word goes forth proclaiming salvation to all who forsake their wicked ways and return to the Lord. You see, scripture is indispensable in the salvation of souls. God uses his word to save sinners. Just think of it. Without the word of God, there would actually be no saving work of God. The Bible is absolutely necessary because we are saved by grace through faith. And faith comes through hearing the word. Let me conclude by just reading from Romans chapter 10. Paul makes this argument and we need to understand it. John 10 verse, or not John, Romans 10 verse 13 says, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? He concludes this way. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Brothers and sisters, God has given us the privilege of taking his word and sharing it with a lost and dying world. We must take part in sharing his word among all the neighborhoods and all the nations of the world. God's word will succeed, which means we should have such confidence as we go proclaiming this message to the world. God will use his word to save sinners. God has determined to save a people from every tribe and tongue and people and language. He has sent forth his saving word and it will accomplish its mission. It will complete its task. God's word will succeed 
in saving and sanctifying a people to God's own glory. And we get the privilege of bearing this message to the ends of the earth. Listen again to God's confidence that what he has said will come to pass. He says, my word that goes out from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty. It shall accomplish that which I purpose. It shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, we are so thankful that you have given us your word and that your word is busy doing its work. Lord, we thank you that your word is sanctifying, growing, maturing a people, but it's also being used to bring life. People are born again by the very word of God. It's only when the word is proclaimed that people repent and believe. Lord, we pray that you would use us with your word to complete your mission. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.